Doubtless you are wondering how I plan to return her to her proper shape, Schmendrick offered. Wonder not. The power will come to me when I need it. I know that much now. One day, it will come to me when I call. But that time is not yet. Impulsively, he seized Molly Grew, hugging her head in his long arms. But you were right, he cried. You were right. It's right there, and it is mine. Molly pulled away from him, one cheek roughed red and both ears smashed. The girl sighed in her lap, ceased to smile, turned her face from the sunrise. Sh Molly said, Schmendrick, you poor man, you magician, don't you see? See what? There's nothing to see. But his voice was suddenly hard and wary, and his green eyes were beginning to be frightened. The Red Bull came for a unicorn, so she had to become something else. You begged me to change her. What is it that frets you now? Molly shook her head in the wavering way of an old woman. She said, I didn't know you meant to turn her into a human girl. You would have done better. She didn't finish, but looked away from him, one hand continuing to stroke the white girl's hair. The magic choose, chose the shape, not I, Schmendrick answered. A Montback may select this cheat or that, but a magician is a porter, a donkey carrying his master where he must. The magician calls, but the magic chooses. If it changes a unicorn to a human being, then that was the only thing to do. His face was fevered with an ardent delirium, which made him look even younger. I am a bearer, he sang. I am a dwelling. I am a messenger. You are an idiot, Molly Grew said fiercely. Do you hear me? You're a magician, all right, but you're a stupid magician. But the girl was trying to wake, her hands opening and closing and her eyelids beating like birds' breasts. As Molly and Schmendrick looked on, the girl made a soft sound and opened her eyes. They were farther apart than common, and somewhat deeper set, and they were as dark as the deep sea and illuminated like the sea by a strange, <clears throat> glimmering creatures that never rose to the surface. The unicorn could have been transformed into a lizard, Molly thought, or into a shark, a snail, a goose, and somehow still her eyes would have given the change away to me anyways, I would know. The girl lay without moving, her eyes finding herself in Molly's eyes and in Schmendrick's. Then, in one motion, she was on her feet, the black cloak falling back across Molly's lap. For a moment, she turned in a circle, staring at her hands, which she held high and useless, close to her breasts. She bobbed and shambled like an ape doing a trick, and her face was the silly, bewildered face of a joker's victim. And yet she could make no move that was not beautiful. Her trapped terror was more lovely than any joy that Molly had ever seen, and that was the most terrible thing about it. Donkey, Molly said. Messenger. I can change her back, the magician answered hoarsely. Don't worry about it. I can change her back. Shining in the sun, the white girl hobbled to and fro on strong young legs. She stumbled suddenly and fell, and it was a bad fall because she did not know how to catch herself with her hands. Molly flew to her, but the girl crouched on the ground, staring, and spoke in a low voice. What have you done to me? Molly Grew began to cry. Schmendrick came forward, his face cold and wet, but his voice level. I turned you into a human being to save you from the Red Bull. There was nothing else I could do. I will turn you to yourself again as soon as I can. The Red Bull, the girl whispered. Oh, she was trembling wildly, as though something were shaking and hammering at her skin from within. He was too strong, she said, too strong. There was no end to his strength and no beginning. He is older than I. Her eyes widened, and it seemed to Molly that the bull moved in them, crossing their depths like a flaming fish and vanishing. The girl began to touch her face timidly, recoiling from the feel of her own features. Her curled fingers brushed the mark on her forehead, and she closed her eyes and gave a thin, stabbing howl of loss and weariness and utter despair. "'What have you done to me?' she cried. "'I will die here!' She tore at the smooth body, and blood flowed under her fingers. "'I will die here! I will die!' Yet there was no fear in her face, though it ramped in her voice in her hands and feet, in the white hair that fell down over her new body. Her face remained quiet and untroubled. Molly huddled over her, as near as she dared, begging her not to hurt herself. But Schmendrick said, Be still! 
and the two words cracked like autumn branches. He said, the magic knew what it was doing. Be still and listen. Why did you not let the bull kill me? The white girl moaned. Why did you not leave me to the harpy? That would have been kinder than closing me in this cage. The magician winced, remembering Molly Grew's mocking accusation, but he spoke with a desperate calmness. In the first place, it's quite an attractive shape, he said. You couldn't have done much better and still remained human. She looked at herself, sideways at her shoulders and along her arms, then down her scratched and welting body. She stood on one foot to inspect the sole of the other, cocked her eyes up to see the silver brows, squinted down her cheeks to catch a flash of her nose, and even peered closely at the sea-green veins inside her wrists, themselves as gaily made as young otters. At last she turned her face to the magician, and again he caught his breath. I have made magic, he thought, but sorrow winked sharp in his throat like a fish-hook settling fast. All right, he said. It would make no difference to you if I had changed you into a rhinoceros, which is where the whole silly myth got started. But in this guise, you have some chance of reaching King Haggard and finding out what has become of your people. As a unicorn, you would only suffer their fate, unless you think you could defeat the bull if you met him a second time. The white girl shook her head. No, she answered. Never. Another time, I would not stand so long. Her voice was too soft, as though its bones had been broken. She said, My people are gone, and I will follow them soon, whatever shape you trap me in. But I would have chosen any other than this for my prison. A rhinoceros is, is, is as ugly as a human being, and it too is going to die, but at least it never thinks that it's beautiful. No, it never thinks that, the magician agreed. That's why it goes on being a rhinoceros and will never be welcome at Haggard's court. But a young girl, a girl to whom it can never mean anything that she is not a rhinoceros, such a girl while the king and his son seek to solve her, might unravel her own riddle until she comes to its end. Rhinoceri are not questing beasts, but young girls are. The sky was hot and curdled. The sun had already melted into a lion-colored puddle, and the, on the plain of Hag's Gate, nothing stirred but the stale, heavy wind. The naked girl with the flower mark on her forehead stared silently at the green-eyed man, and the woman watched them both. In the tawny morning, King Haggard's castle seemed neither dark nor accursed, but merely grimy, run-down, and poorly designed. Its skinny spires looked nothing like bull's horns, but rather like those on a jester's cap, or like the horns of a dilemma, Schmendrick thought. They never have just two. The white girl said, I am myself still. This body is dying. I can feel it rotting all around me. How can anything that is going to die be real? How can it be truly beautiful? Molly Grew put the magician's cloak around her shoulders again, not for modesty or seemliness, but out of a strange pity, as though to keep her from seeing herself. I will tell you a story, Schmendrick said. As a child, I was apprenticed to the mightiest magician of all, the great Nikos, whom I have spoken of before. But even Nikos, who could turn cats into cattle, snowflakes into snowdrops, and unicorns into men, could not change me into so much as a carnival card shark. At last he said to me, My son, your ineptitude is so vast, your incompetence so profound, that I am certain you are inhabited by a greater power than I have ever known. Unfortunately, it seems to be working backward at the moment, and even I can find no way to set it right. It must be that you are meant to find your own way to reach your own power in time. But frankly, you should live so long that it will take you. Therefore, I grant it that you shall not age from this day forth, but will travel the world round and round, eternally inefficient, until at last you come to yourself and know what you are. Don't thank me. I tremble at your doom. The white girl regarded him out of a unicorn's clear, amaranth eyes, gentle and frightening in the unused face, but she said nothing. It was Molly Grew who then asked, And if you should find your magic, what then? Then the spell will be broken, and I will begin to die, as I began at my birth. Even the greatest wizards grow old like other men and die. He swayed and nodded, and then snapped awake again. A tall, thin, shabby man, smelling of dust and drink. I told you that I was older than I look, he said. 
I was born mortal, and I have been immortal for a long, foolish time, and one day I will be mortal again. So I know something that a unicorn cannot know. Whatever can die is beautiful. More beautiful than a unicorn who lives forever, than who is the most beautiful creature in the world. Do you understand me? No, she said. The magician smiled wearily. You will. You're in the story with the rest of us now, and you must go with it, whether you will or no. If you want to find your people, if you want to become a unicorn again, then you must follow the fairy tale to King Haggard's castle and whatever else it chooses to take you to. The story cannot end without the princess. The white girl said, I will not go. She stepped away, her body wary and the cold hair falling down. I am no princess, no mortal, and I will not go. Nothing but evil has happened to me since I left my forest, and nothing but evil can have become of the unicorns in this country. Give me my true shape again, and I will return to my trees, to my pool, to my own place. Your tail has no power over me. I am a unicorn. I am the last unicorn. Had she said that once before, long ago, in the blue-green silence of the trees? Schmendrick continued to smile, but Molly Grew said, Change her back. You said you could change her. Let her go home. I cannot, the magician answered. I told you. The magic is not mine to command. Not yet. That is why I, too, must go to the castle. And the fate or fortune that waits there. If I tried to undo the transformation now, I might actually turn her into a rhinoceros. That would be the best thing that could happen. As for the worst... He shivered and fell silent. The girl turned from them and looked away at the castle that stooped over the valley. She could see no movements at any window or among the tottering turrets or any sign of the Red Bull. Yet she knew that he was there, brooding at the castle's roots till night should fall again, strong beyond in strength, invincible as the night itself. For a second time, she touched the place on her forehead where her horn had been. When she turned again, they were asleep where they sat, the man and the woman. Their heads were pillowed on air, and their mouths hung open. She stood by them, watching them breathe, one hand holding the black cloak closely at her throat. Very faintly, for the first time, the smell of the sea came to her.